Communities are made up of individuals, a dynamic that exemplifies the concept of holons, a term invented by Arthur Kosler in the 1960s and developed by integral philosopher Ken Wilber. A holon is something that has integrity and identity unto itself while simultaneously being part of a larger system, a subsystem of a greater system, anything that's both a whole and a part of a greater whole. Our body is formed by individual organ systems. Each complete organ is made up of smaller parts called cells. Each cell is made up of molecules. Each molecule is made of atoms. Each atom is made of subatomic particles. With the idea of holons, we can see the harmonic nested hierarchies or holarchies that bring us to life. The holon concept honors the wholeness and partness of everything. The word holon is derived from the Greek words for whole and part. So a whole community is made of individual people. The old world is ending. And we have the opportunity to rethink everything. This is a show about the systemic problems in our world. And the real solutions we have today. To transition from an apocalyptic storm of war, scarcity, and ecological collapse. To create an abundantly advanced collaborative society. That sustains all life. You may think it's an impossible dream. But the alternative is an inevitable nightmare. We're your hosts, Matt Holton. Amanda Smith. And Zachary Marlowe. And together. We can move past this economic absurdity and come together to actualize our collective potential to create something completely new. We are Mindless Society. Holacracy, the revolutionary management system that abolishes hierarchy. No, this isn't a radical zine from the anarchist bookstore. It's a book, an organization, and a system by, created by Brian Robertson, a software developer and CEO in the corporate world. So Holacracy is a radical new system that we've encountered quite a few times working with other organizations and groups and just looking for better ways, looking for ways to rethink how do we organize ourselves? How do we not just try to have the intention to do better, but how do we actually systematize our behavior in truly new and evolutionary ways? So Brian, uh, I'll, why don't you just take it from the top there? What is Holacracy? Yeah, thanks for the intro. Um, so like you said, it's a new management system. Uh, it's a new way of breaking down work and trying to organize around a purpose. You know, there were some reason we're here together, something we're trying to achieve or try to do. And to do that, we need to do the work that's typically called management, um, which are things like defining who's going to do what, you know, what are the roles involved and what are the boundaries between roles? What's your job versus, you know, Matt's job or somebody else's job. Um, and and then from there, we need ways to kind of, you know, hold each other accountable or at least get clarity on who's doing what, how are they doing, uh, maybe influence their priorities or, or set new expectations, uh, change policies. Now, all of this is what we kind of broadly call management. And I think people tend to assume that the only way to get management is to centralize it uh, at the top of a hierarchy and break it down, right? That's we have the classic management hierarchy. Uh, but in fact, there are, are other ways to get management. We do need for any organization needs to be managed, so to speak, but that doesn't necessarily imply a command hierarchy is the only way to get management. So holacracy, you could say, is management without managers. It's a system that gives you management in a decentralized way, while everyone has a lot more power and everyone is, is taking part in the work of management. Yeah, so I was curious. Does Marlo was saying a system that abolishes hierarchy? Is this is that accurate? Is is hierarchy actually abolished within this management system, or does it kind of still <laughs> exist in some various you know forms and instances? So I, I have to. I hate that subtitle. <laughs> There's two versions of the of my book. One is the American printing. One is the British printing. That's the British printing with that subtitle, uh, which I had no control over. The American printing uh, has a different subtitle. It's um, the new management system for a rapidly changing world. Uh, but the Brits, they wanted to really hit this abolish hierarchy, and somehow abolish just seems like a British, you know, phrase or something. But uh, it, they're always I mean, abolishing stuff. Abolish yeah. this. Abolish that. 
It's exactly, bollocks. Right? <laughs> no reform, only abolishment. <laughs> you know, they, they just, just keep ruining our language, those Brits. But um, <laughs> I, um, the reason I don't like it is uh, it's both true and not true, depending on what we mean and what we're talking about, right? Uh, it does get rid of the traditional command hierarchy. You don't have anything that looks like a hierarchy of people who can boss other people around, right? That's gone. But you know, hierarchy is just a, a type of structure. There's other forms. So holacracy does use a type of hierarchy, but it's a, first you could think of it as a hierarchy of purpose, right? We start with what's the broader purpose of the whole organization and that gets broken down. Every team has a purpose that's a piece of that. And every role within a team has a purpose that's a piece of the purpose of the team, which is a piece of the purpose of the company. So that's, that's a hierarchy of purpose. And then there's a definitional hierarchy where the broadest team in the organization has the authority to define the boundaries of the sub teams, right? In other words, what's in scope for sales versus what's in scope for marketing? Where's the boundary between them? It can't command them. It can't tell them what to do, but it can define the purpose and the boundaries of the sub teams. And then within each of those sub teams, they can define the purpose and the boundaries of any sub team from there or any roles within the team or whatever. So you have hierarchy in there. That is a hierarchy. It's a definitional hierarchy, not a command hierarchy. And it's a definitional hierarchy of roles and purpose instead of a command hierarchy of people bossing around other people. So I, I think one of the, the traps of this, when we're talking about new methods and people here, Holacracy has, you know, no management hierarchy, no managers, which is true, but people tend to imagine what they're used to today and just remove managers and command hierarchy and picture something like a flat organization. And, and those approaches tend to not work so well at scale. It's not that at all. Um, Holacracy uses just a different structure. What, what's harder to imagine uh, is what replaces the management hierarchy because you do need management even if you're not gonna use a command hierarchy of managers, right? So it's, it's really about creating a framework uh, that does the work of management. Um, is that framework hierarchical? Well, again, a hierarchy is such a, we, we use that word thinking it means just one thing, but it's a very broad term. There's lots of hierarchy. In fact, even across different roles we create, like in my company, I deliver a lot of training, uh, trainings, lockers, trainings, and we have another role that chooses venues for our trainings, for example. Uh, and you could say there's a, even a command relationship between those two roles in a way. The role that chooses venues has a requirement, an obligation, that they have to find a venue that fits the trainer's requirements. But on the other hand, they get to tell me where to go and train. So it's it's not a simple boss-subordinate relationship. It's I have my authority, they have their authority, you know? And the boundaries between us are clear so we can each lead our piece of the system. That's what I mean by a decentralized power structure, right? It's kind of like we're each the CEO of our role in there and we have clear boundaries between us. Like in society, right? We don't need barons and kings telling us what to do in a top-down command hierarchy when we have clear boundaries. I know what's mine to control and what's my neighbor's to control, right? We know where the boundary exists between us and we know how to navigate that so we can each have sovereignty even in connection. I, I love this system and I've, I've been really interested in it for quite a while now. And I, I've, this, this is a conversation I've been looking forward to having because uh, we have our own organization and we've been working uh, to develop it and to build it up and to you know, create this uh, transition to this very lofty, very ambitious uh, sort of systems change that we want to re really realize and at every level we can, a change to the way that things are done. You know, the old ways are clearly falling apart all around us. You know, more science and more um, just, you know, human experiences of the failures of our existing system come out every single day. And we're finding that there is this beautiful renaissance happening of new ways of doing things. I, th I truly believe there is a better way of doing every single thing that we do. And I think uh, the essence of our, I think, movement of our train of thought that we apply things to, it's not based in an ideology, it's based in systems. It's based in seeing the ways that things interconnect. And I love that in um, a couple of your talks, you said, basically, there's no boss of your body, you know, yeah. like there's no uh, organ that is the most important, even the brain there's a decentralized aspect of the brain, of the nervous system. You have an enteric nervous system in your gut. You have sort of sensors all through your body that are helping kind of keep the body coordinated, that it, everything in life is a cooperative process, that nature itself has no hierarchy. Even the apex predator is eventually broken down by the worm. And they all sort of function together in this egalitarian sort of cooperative flow together. So I think that this um, sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's um, it's biomimicry in action 
that yeah. it's creating a system that is more like nature and less like the complex of a hierarchical sort of boss dominator that uh, you know humans have sort of developed as this traumatized reaction to a crazy complex world and then mapped onto reality as if it's everything when it's not we know yeah. there's many many other ways of living yeah i think i think uh, it's a great point if you look at the history or modern management grew up in an age that was actually quite a bit simpler than our current current one right <laughs> In the, the, the late 1800s, as modern management was starting to be really born in its current form in the early 1900s, the world was a lot simpler. The, the pace of change was slower. The complexity level was dramatically lower. And you didn't need as sophisticated an, an approach. I, I actually think we are sitting here talking about alternate ways to manage organizations, not because simple management hierarchy failed miserably, but because it succeeded so wildly that it helped build a world more complex than it could manage. Right, like the simple approach we had for for trying to, to control an organization was fine in a more predictable, more simple, less complex world. But that world is gone. That's changed dramatically. We now live in a massively complex system, and that's where the the nature examples I think come in. If if we want to be inspired by you know what's what designs for massively complex interconnected systems work really well, well, nature is a really really good thing to to learn from right? Trillions of cells in our body working together harmoniously, and they don't need a CEO cell telling others what to do in a top-down command hierarchy. They use something very different, you know? And so I think as complexity grows, modern management is simply becoming obsolete. If I could just interject really quick, I know Matt had a direct response to what you were saying earlier after you answered his question, and I did too. And I just wanted to point out that you yourself, um, Describe holacracy as a purpose-driven system. And to um, perhaps help sum up how to answer Matt's question, it, it would seem at least as a purpose-driven system, inherently uh, hierarchy as we know it could not exist because it wouldn't be based on status quo and egos. It's based on reaching the goals, the purpose of the whole organization to begin with. And I like so much that you're very clear on how those things are accomplished through a demonstrable, demonstrable skill authority versus the authority that we know today. Uh, but I'll hand it over to Matt, even though I'm itching to ask a lot of questions. And one I hope that we'll get to um, is how the holacracy structure helps to provide more levels of accountability and uh, access to alignment within an organization between teams and individuals. Um, yeah, no, I just wanted to add too that I've, I've... I think that's really cool. I agree with every, with everything that you're saying. I'm, I'm, one of, I was watching a couple of your videos as well. One of the things I really uh, found interesting was kind of the difference between the job description and roles. You know, it's 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 kind of like what we're talking about. Just kind of tr tr really trying to be clear about the language and exactly what it is that we're trying to do and define and everything. And I like that this this uh, whole management system takes an approach like that, where it just kind of really dives in, really opens up the communication. Um, and just lets people kind of have their autonomy within these roles, essentially, and gives a lot gives people a lot more autonomy to choose which roles they do want to take on and don't want to take on, uh, come to agreements between those roles and exactly what's expected of them or not expected of them. And it's just this constantly evolving dynamic thing, like, you know, like an organism that we would see in nature or something, you know, constantly evolving to what's needed from it and, uh, you know, the direction and purpose that it's serving and things like that. That rather than just some, I mean, to me, it's kind of just like a dictatorship, the systems that we have right now. It models, you know, the, the, like you were saying, the feudal system or, or other, you know, kind of typical, you know, capitalist management systems, essentially just this top down thing. But yeah, it's, it's totally obsolete. And another thing I really like that you were saying too, is a lot of CEOs, they actually want this, you know, because they, they understand that the world we have created now is, is too complex. It's too complex for these old management systems. And it's probably overwhelming for a a lot of them and um and, and we really need things like that in order to one satisfy you know the people who are actually putting in the work because a lot of people now they want to feel like you know they actually have some autonomy and purpose and uh you know they can can fulfill their roles the way that they feel is best rather than just following orders from the top down so i really think it just the, the whole thing just reflects a shift in values in our culture, I think, I'm going from just kind of this, you know, 
profit at all costs sort of mindset and growth is growth at all costs is a good thing to just kind of really working together and examining, you know, the details of, of these things and how they really operate, what the effects of them really are, you know, and, and, uh, just kind of diving down into the nitty gritty. It's like, that's where everything's going these days. Just really opening up that community, those lines of communication, getting it all out and, and letting it evolve. And that was another thing too. I really like how you guys just kind of were open to this thing evolving over time. You know, it was just kind of more of a thing that it, it wasn't, you planned it all out one day. It was something that you assessed and adjusted and readjusted. And again, going back to that, you know, just kind of this thing being more of a natural you know, evolution of management systems. I just, I, I, I can't see, I, I, I think you nailed it in other words. Sorry. Mm. He did nail it when he described it as an evolutionary design algorithm, Yeah, but it's powered by people, which is how, um, I think that marries our potential as people to work together and organize in a better way with what we can accomplish with the technology we have today. Yeah, I, a few thoughts on what you said. One, I love that description of an evolutionary algorithm for organizational design. It really is. It's uh, We don't know how to solve complex problems up front. We can't know when the problem is too complex, and most organizations are facing complex problems today. So it works a lot better to try stuff, trial and error, experimentation and adapt, sense and respond, not predict and control. Uh, and, and that's ultimately what Holacracy is, a framework to allow people to try stuff, sense what's working, what's not, and then update the design of the organism of the company, if you will, uh, to figure out how to best serve the purpose at play. And that's not only uh, not opposed to even the ideas of conventional management. I, I Earlier in my, my path with this was kind of like a no, we need to get rid of management. And, and uh, that was definitely the, the younger, less mature version of me. Now I realize, no, actually the goals of this are exactly what management wants. It just doesn't do it that well in a complex environment, right? Like what, what do we ideally want from a boss, you know, in a management hierarchy? We want somebody that creates clarity of what your job is and then gets out of your way, leaves you empowered to go lead and do it. You know, Holacracy just takes the same things and it puts it into a system so that you don't need a superhero manager because there's not enough of them to go around. And when you get a really good one, they get promoted and replaced by somebody who's not as good, right? Like it's really hard in a complex system to be a good manager. And the, the last thing I want to say, and I'll pause is uh, also the, the and not only is, is, is it not opposed to making profits, uh, giving people more power, more voice, more ability to use their passion and their purpose uh, themselves to drive change helps everyone. It helps your customers, it helps your people, it helps, helps profit. It's uh, another uh, way to say it. There's a great quote from my friend, uh, John Mackey, who's the founder of Whole Foods in his book, uh, Conscious Capitalism. He writes, um, he writes uh, if something like this, it's, if, if you want to just get filthy rich and you don't care who you step on along the way, you don't care what you do, you don't care what kind of evil stuff you do, whatever, the most effective strategy you can take is run the most conscious business possible that focuses on serving all of its stakeholders. It's people, it, the environment around it, it's customers, it's investors, everyone, because that's just more effective, right? These aren't opposed ideas. Uh, I think we often see them and think of them as opposed in one framework or system we're used to. It's either management or the people, it's the investors or the team or the customers. I don't see any of these as opposed. They're all parts of an interconnected system. And when we find a way to serve that system really well, all of them can do better. Rising tide lifts all ships. I just want to pick up on a word that you use a lot um, that I really like, um, and it's sense. You use the word sense a lot. Like sense is this really crucial um, feedback point or metric in um, making decisions and in understanding society. You know, people like Daniel Schmachtenberger are all about sense making. I mean, I think that's that's really what is needed. We don't just need decision making. We don't just need do it now, do it now, do it now. We need to like, okay, how do we make sense of ourselves? How do we create new systems that are based on feedback, on based on basically getting the input of all peoples and creating this evolutionary algorithm to get them working? I just want to kind of um, point out a minute, <clears throat> kind of dig into that a little bit and um, go into the sort of failings of traditional hierarchical structure. Uh, I was reading an article the other day in Wired, I believe, um, about Elon Musk and like how he is as a boss. 
And it was just like all of these people talking about all these volatile experiences where like something smelled bad and he was like, you're fired. You know, it was just like some machine wasn't working right then. And even though it was just talking about this fresh faced engineer who like worked so hard to get into this position, was like doing such a good job. And everybody's like, we love what you're doing. And Elon was like at this machine and it wasn't working right as he wanted it to. And he just immediately fired this guy. And, you know, it was just talking about like, oh, well, you know, he's, he's brilliant in all these ways, but, but it's like he's volatile. And it's like it just that to me. Uh, I really see that it's not necessarily just this personal problem. It's that when we exalt people into this position of hierarchy, they stop making sense. Sense stops being made because that person is in this this bottleneck of this pyramid. They're in the top. They're alone. They're under all of this stress and turmoil and conflict. It's almost like when we put people at the top of a hierarchy, I see it as a form of trauma, especially in a competitive hierarchy where everybody's coming at you all the time. You can't trust people. Like, you, like uh, there was a really interesting interchange between um, uh, what's that show? Um, it's not Joe Rogan. It's like smart Joe Rogan. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Uh, oh, what's his name? Um, scratch that from the record, whatever. Uh, but <laughs> Kanye West was interviewing somebody, being interviewed. And he was like, don't you? He's like, I'm trying to give you feedback. You know, and he's like, don't you trust me? He's like, I don't trust you. And it's like when you have somebody at the top of this position of power, I mean, so much research has gone into how power acts on the brain like brain damage. And it stops you from being able to read the room. It stops you from being able to get that feedback from the people around you. So it's ultimately, even for those people at the top that are the boss, that are the top dog, that are the most successful, they really need to understand that it benefits them to get outside of that system, to create a better accountability structure where those brilliant aspects of a person are exalted and are able to you know, do what they do. We're able to uh, succeed in our own lane, in our own area, in our own um, role. But it's not like we're putting somebody into some position that they can just go mad with power with, and there's nothing we can do about it. And it, yeah. it, it's ultimately destructive to every to part and parcel, to the whole ecosystem, to exalt one person, to fill them up like with blood, like this tick. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, having been there and uh, you know been in that CEO role that led to the development of Holacracy initially, it's so lonely. Um, I actually read a, a study about this uh, once it found of all of the different uh, typical roles in a, a company, the ones that reported consistently the most loneliness were the, the CEO role. Um, the higher up you got, the more lonely you get. And, and I felt that, you know, I had all these great people around me, even in a small company that I, and I love the people and, and yet there was some obstacle to connection. And that obstacle was the, the weird personally held power in the room stopped me from just being one of them, you know, in, in, in some way. And, and it, it caused all sorts of just really subtle damage in the relationship. Uh, and I got to a point where I said, I don't want to have employees anymore. And now I don't, I have all business partners. Uh, and th that's a legal reality for us. It's, uh, you can actually adopt holacracy in the legal bylaws if you want. Uh, not everyone does that, which is fine, but um, we have, you know, now a structure where I don't have this special privileged position of power and all the, the harm, the loneliness, the sadness that caused me. And yet I still have the ability to use my talents and drive change, right? I just have to do it in the same system that everyone else does. Sometimes people think that holacracy is stripping power away from those at the top and dividing it out to the others, redistribution of power. And that's actually missing it. It's not that. It's not taking power away from those at the top. It's raising power of everyone else in the system, right? So what's happening is you're giving more power to everyone so they can really lead their part. And then you're creating boundaries on it. You can lead your part and just your part. And if you want to connect and expect something different from somebody else's part, there are defined processes for that, that we all have equal access to, right? So what you end up with is not redistributed power in a company. It's more power in a company, right? And now everyone is kind of in that like top space of like, there's something that they're really leading and really responsible for. But now we're all in that together. And it doesn't have this weird hierarchical power thing that we get in command hierarchies. It feels completely different. We have a comrade and a volunteer who is coding a site called Magnova, Lavra, our beloved Del uh, Lavra. And uh, when I first listened to your TED talk, you said something that reminded me of them and they would probably agree is their uh, praxis to a uh, point. Um, the fact that what you've seen was this big gap, and as you describe it, a tension between what could be and what was happening and going on in the moment. Um, and basically, the 
the inability to see that there needed to be a change or an advancement made and not having the, the bureaucratic authority to make that change. Um, and, and as you described in your talk, how, you know, people will like uh, build up a big buy-in, you know, they'll, they'll come up with a presentation, they'll talk to a lot of people in their hierarchy, and they'll try to push change, but it could never happen. And if it does, it will take a very long time. And obviously, that's inefficient in of itself. But at the same time, I, I can hear people already, uh, if I'm trying to describe this holacracy structure to them, that would be like, well, this sounds chaotic if just anybody can participate, if just anybody can throw in their two cents and change things as they, as they see fit uh, upon their own discretion. How, how, how do we pull that down for, for those people and, and help them understand that it's, it's not a chaotic uh, structure, which I guess is a contradictory term. Um, but instead, as you were saying, um, it just allows more autonomy across the board and yeah. obsoletes those bureaucratic channels that obviously aren't useful to begin with. Yeah. So we talked about one of the common myths that uh, people have, which is, you know, thinking that um, uh, just because there's, you know, no managers, it's chaotic and there's no management. Let's break that down a little bit. The other common one is uh, people hear there's no management hierarchy and they'll think there's no structure. And there's actually more structure, not less than in a conventional company, right? More clarity of structure. We've talked about roles. It's a role-based system. Uh, people fill, fill many roles, often in many teams. I have 20 roles in my company, for example, in like three or four different teams. Um, and, uh, and, and then there's a process to update those roles and the boundaries between them, right? What does my role do? What does your role do? Uh, and that process, not anyone is invited to have their two cents in anything. First of all, within any given role, there's more autocratic decision-making. Um, so we're used to, in management hierarchy, ironically, a lot of really slow consensus building processes where you have to do the presentation, get everyone bought in, bring something to the meeting. With holacracy, there's actually more uh, autocratic autonomy. It's If it's your role, you're the boss of your role, you go lead it. And if somebody else wants some expectations with you, well, then it's up to them to define those boundaries. And they do that in what we call a governance process. So far from just free form, everyone can talk about everything. It's another common myth that decisions are made by giant groups and consensus, which is ironic because that's the way things happen in management hierarchies more often than not. But uh, with holacracy, it's not. It's about getting really clear uh, who makes which decisions and within what limits and what boundaries, right? Where, where is the power? And we do that in this, I mentioned the governance process. So uh, that process, I can give an example of it, a little story. It's pretty, pretty cool to illustrate. So it's a defined facilitated process. There is a facilitator elected from the team. It's happening in every team, not just once for the whole company, but every team is doing this governance process to govern the roles and policies of their team, to define the structure and evolve it. And uh, that that process is uh, it's, it's pretty cool. It's a different decision-making system than most people are used to. It, it does give everyone a voice, but it doesn't suffer from what I call the tyranny of consensus, which is where everyone has a voice and nothing can get changed because everyone has to agree. Uh, and it starts with somebody bringing a proposal to change something in the power structure or the expectation structure of the, the, the team. And anyone on the team is invited to participate in that governance process. Anyone working on the team, you have to actually be in a role working on the team to participate. And here's a real story of one way this played out um, long ago in my company. So I do a lot of speaking at conferences and I fill a role that does that called Holacracy Spokesperson, right? And I work with a, another colleague of mine who fills a role called Casting Agent. And the Casting Agent role has to book me for talks. Right? And we get a lot of invites. So she filters through all of these different invites and she has to negotiate. So she'll often build a relationship with a conference organizer. And you know, she'll try to define what's the talk about, what's the length, you know, uh, when, where, are we getting paid for it, you know, all that stuff. And what was happening uh, regularly is at the end of all of that work of hers, she'd present the opportunity to me and I'd look at it and sometimes I'd shoot it down and say, no, I'm not gonna go to that. It's not worth my time, right? Maybe wrong market or it's not big enough or whatever. And imagine that was kind of frustrating, right? She's built all this, uh, she's built a relationship. She spent time and energy and I just shoot it down at the end of her process um, for criteria that she doesn't even know. So she comes to our governance meeting. This is of our marketing circle, we call it marketing team, right? She comes to the governance meeting and she proposes adding an expectation on my role. She says she wants to expect my role to be defining the criteria, like documenting the criteria I'm gonna use to decide what I accept or not and then align with that, 
right? Because she said, if I knew your criteria up front, I could assess it myself before I waste all that time. So in that governance process, with the facilitated process that it is, we don't ask everyone, do you agree? Do you think this is a great idea? We just ask, is there any reason why adding this expectation to the spokesperson role is going to get in your way of doing your roles on this team? Right. Like basically, is it irrelevant or relevant? And if it's relevant and it's useful to the purpose, the purpose that team was formed, then it's a go. We're we're not even asking that. We are assuming it's relevant because someone had attention and proposed it. Unless someone else can say, here's how it's going to get in my way. And even that doesn't stop it. It just gives us a puzzle to solve. How can we still address your need without getting in the way? But in this case, it wouldn't get in the way. It took two minutes. Two minutes later, we had a new expectation on my role. And she was able to turn to me then after the meeting and say, so when will you have a draft of that uh, criteria done for me by? And the interesting footnote to this story is I'm the founder of the company and a seasoned CEO for many years before that. And she was our newest hire right out of college. In what companies do you know where the newest hire right out of college in two minutes can add an expectation onto the founder and then turn to him and say, when will you have that done for me by? Right? Because it's not about the status and the egos, it's about the purpose and the work. Exactly. And I I think this is a great opportunity. If I could piggyback really fast, Marlon, I'll shut up for a while. Uh, He's always telling me I don't talk enough and I'm too polite, so I'm jumping in there. Um, I think this is a great opportunity to highlight for our listeners the difference and how you you put it, uh, Brian, uh, the difference between a role and a job description. I love how you um, defined a job description as being a bureaucratic artifact. A static job description does not adapt. It doesn't evolve. It's it's just something to help keep the status quo in its place, right? To make sure that there's the top down and then the workers. And with um, the structure uh, of holacracy, you have the opportunity for someone as like the newbie you just described, making that that, that adaptation, proposing that adaptation to the team and the structure so that things can be done more efficiently instead of it taking, as I was saying before, a year or maybe it never happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, spot on. I was I was curious. I have a quick question for you. I was So more and more companies are starting to adopt this. Zap, Zappos is one of the companies that, that's adopting this. Um, I was curious if, you, if you're noticing any patterns of certain companies that are doing better with this type of management system or certain companies that aren't doing so well with it, or maybe even it has to do more with like certain personality types or, or things like that. I was kind of curious if like some people or companies are more successful than others. And if you've noticed kind of why, you know? Yeah. Um, Yes. So interesting what it's not correlated to. It doesn't seem to be correlated to a type of company or industry or type of work. I mean, it's across the board. We see high tech, low tech, service, retail, manufacturing, pretty much everything. Government agency is doing it uh, hmm. now. And um, yeah, where it does though, where, oh, same with type of people. I mean, it's, it's really, it's such a broad system. There's going to be aspects of it that anyone based on their own personality is going to naturally find easy and other parts that are going to challenge them. And that should be true with any good system because it needs to integrate polarities, right? Like if you have a system that biases on one side of what is really a personal preference between two people, you're actually losing something, right? If, if we have to choose between clarity and agility, we're, we're, we've, we've lost, right? How do we get both? How do we get so much clarity that it enables agility and so much agility that clarity becomes actual meaningful because it's evolving, right? Holacracy gives you both. You're going to have more clarity and more agility than a conventional structure. They're not at odds. So it's not about type of people. What it actually seems to come down to is uh, at least for those who are bringing it in, which is usually those at the top of the, the conventional hierarchy that's ceding power to this system, Right. But not always. Sometimes if you have a a group that doesn't have a conventional hierarchy in it, it might be a different power structure. But whatever came before, whatever is seeding power into this structure, it has much more to do with the personal development of those people. Um, And this is fascinating. I've seen people wildly different, all different types of people, uh, all different personality types. But the people who are successful for this, the companies that are successful with this are usually led by people that have done a lot of their own self-work in one form or another. Um, They're able to go back to being a beginner, to question their assumptions, to see their own stories and projections, um, to really learn a completely new way to work uh, and lead. Um, Those are the people. It's the ones with a lot of, they're they're pretty remarkable people and you can can tell and feel it when you you interact Mm -hmm. with them. Nice. So that brings me to one of my uh, biggest questions for you personally. Um, What, what, can you look back at your own story and sort of, piece together like how it is that you came to that sort of development 
how you came to see, no, I don't need to be the boss. I don't want to be in charge, you know, because it's, it's for our society. We are conditioned from childhood, from the family, from all aspects of our society. We have this pyramidal structure in place. It is, it is so embedded. It is so, in, you know, structured and, and ingrained in our society that we think it's real. So many people think it's the only way or that we've been like this forever. When, if you, if you go back and, um, read like uh, David Graeber's new book, The Dawn of Everything. And you, you see that there's just this incredible vibrancy of all of these cultures throughout society, you know, throughout our history that did not have a hierarchical structure, anything like the way that we do it now. Like the uh, Jesuit missionaries um, were observing the natives, some of the first contacts with, um, you know, the, the new world. And they were noticing that like, hey, it's like, okay, this is, seems like chaos. Like they're too free. Like they were really freaked out by how free people were, but like how educated and aware and, and um, like articulate everybody was, everybody participated in society because everybody had a stake in it really. And so they noticed mm -hmm. that, you know, um, if their leaders told them to do something, their leaders, you know, the chief, somebody asked me on Twitter the other day, like, is that hierarchical role, the chief in a, in a society like this? And it's ultimately no, because that person doesn't have authority to say, uh, do this for me or I'm going to take away your food, you know? So there, that's very different relationship where if they told them to do something, they didn't like it. It just laughed at them. You know, that, that is like, that would be broke the brains of the Jesuits. And I think in many ways we have not evolved as a society beyond that very, very old perspective. So how did you personally make that leap? Yeah. Um, so interesting where it didn't come from was, uh, a bunch of principles and ideas, which is usually what you might assume a lot of people assume. Uh, that, you know, I came somehow to these, you know, new ideas, new principles, and then tried to build a system around them. It's actually not how it played out. Um, much like what Holacracy does for a company, it says, well, look, we don't know the, the best way of structuring your company. So let's just keep experimenting and adapting and learning, right? Let's let evolution tell us the right design. Let's not try to be intelligent designers, you know? Uh, the same was true with Holacracy. What I did was just say, there's got to be a better way. <laughs> I love Marlo. You mentioned that a couple of times, that phrase, and I love it. It's one of my favorites. There's just got to be a better way. <laughs> and I, th I, I think about those, uh, those, those, those uh, infomercial commercials where somebody's like flopping around with a wet cucumber or something. They're yeah, like, there's yeah. just got to be a better <laughs> way. Yeah. That's how right. I feel like going through our yeah. society. Like this is ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, there's got to be a better way. I totally agree. Uh, so I was running a software company and that was my sense of there's got to be a better way to do this. So I turned my company into a laboratory and we experimented. And it turns out I did have some principles and some ideas, but most of which turned out to not actually be all that useful or at least not quite right. Um, and what I did was listen to reality. I try something and I noticed uh, that the, the evolutionary selection function here was... Um, does this change to the way we work, make it easier or harder for people to take whatever they're sensing that could be better in the expression of our purpose and drive meaningful change with it? So what I was trying to build was a company where anyone, anywhere in the organization who sensed something that could be better for this purpose, right, could rapidly and reliably achieve meaningful results, meaningful change. And so what I did was just notice what gets in the way of that. Well, okay, painful meetings that take forever gets in the way of that. So let's add experiment with different meeting processes. You know, well, decision-making systems that rely on everyone agreeing, that actually gets in the way of it. So let's create some really efficient decision-making processes. But decision-making processes that don't get the right input also get in the way of it. So we just kept noticing what gets in the way. And then we tried stuff. And a lot of the things we tried didn't work. They were just, they seemed like good ideas in theory and we tossed them out. So really, holacracy itself was the result of an evolutionary process. And we actually capture all of it in a constitution. So there's a written document, the constitu holacracy constitution. It's an open source document. You can find it on the web, on our website. Um, and it's, uh, it captures the rules of the game. Like any sport, it's a rule book for the rules of the game of how to play this game. And that is version controlled and evolved much like open source software. We're on version 5.0 right now. And yeah, it's a... Uh, a very different way of discovering more than creating a new management framework. I want to pick up on something you said there um, that, uh, you know, principles and ideals aren't necessarily what drove you to this. And I'm going to, I'm going to recall this, uh, this book cover again, because it's, it's just funny to me because I, <laughs> you know, it's like holacracy is a revolutionary underlying tried and tested new system. And I just, mm. these are, it's interesting the angle that they took this in, yeah. but it says uh, the organization looks like a nest of circles, not a pyramid, but it's not anarchy. And that's in like red bold. And I think yeah. it's interesting that um, 
the things you were talking about, the structure you have created, this non-hierarchical and against Archie hierarchical structure is, an, is functionally an anarchist structure, but through the lens of the corporate world, which is, I think is very interesting to me and is one of the reasons I, I felt that this conversation was going to be interesting because I first started using a system like this in radical activist groups, you know, this, this non-hierarchical decentralized decision-making system. And we came about it from a very different perspective. And I think a lot of anarchist theory is what informed that. So what's interesting to me is closing that loop and coming together. You come from the corporate world, which, you know, they're in many ways, you know, the, the antithesis, you know, you have this very bottom up thing. You have this total top down hierarchy. You have the people with the power. You have the people who got no power. And we're trying to reconcile that. And I think ultimately that's, that's the, there's got to be a better way question that everybody I think faces or doesn't really face. And that's the, the system itself, that our system itself, not just the people involved in charge, you know, because you can, you can add new politicians to the system and they just become the same thing. They erode mm -hmm. into those positions. You can take, like you were saying, that good manager, you put another person into that role the role itself, you know, unless that person has done a tremendous amount of personal self and work and development, it's a corrupting structure. And so that's basically the crux of our show is how do we change the system? How do we change the, the, the structure of our society? And so in taking out, this might be a bit of a, a big leap question here, but I'm curious, and I'm sure you've thought about this in some capacity, how can we apply these holocratic principles, this sort of egalitarian, open you said open access, decision-making, sense-making system where everybody is given a role, everybody is given a stake, everybody is treated as an equal. How do we apply that to our society, which just overall is, you know, of course, the, the uh, re pure reflection of that pyramidal corporate system, which hasn't changed since fucking Egypt, essentially. You got a few people at the top making all the decisions with all the power and the wealth, and you have the people at the bottom and they don't really have any recourse to give their feedback. And and it, it's, it's not even just that those people at the top are evil bastards. It's that there's not a sense-making system where the feedback and the genuine experience of those people at the bottom can make it up the pyramid so that those people even know that life is very different and that it's not working in these key ways. Yeah. So sorry. Okay, so, <laughs> no, it's great. You you know, several things that. in there. Um, yeah, I love that you started with the anarchy. And it's funny you were quoting from the the, the uh British copy of the book. I had no say. They didn't give me any say in the, the what what went on that that book back, <laughs> the content of the book I wrote. But and I I I saw that and it just killed me when they said it's not anarchy. Uh, and I get what they're they're saying. They're saying it's not like just everyone does their own thing. Everything's chaotic. It's highly structured, highly ordered system. It it is an emergent order. It's like the human body is a highly structured, highly ordered system that still relies on emergent order and uh, it's a more dynamic system, living system. Uh, it, it's like that, but it's certainly um, structured. But but that's the root of the word anarchy. I think you put it out it and on from the Greek without and then uh, archon rulers. Anarchy doesn't mean without rules. It means without rulers, right? And you can certainly say holacracy is a rule system for working together in anarchy, right? Um, it is a rule system for working together without top down rulers. You know so. For me, I mean, most people would uh, probably, if they talked to me long enough and tried to find a single word to bucket me politically, which is very, very difficult to do, um, they would probably call me an anarchist. <laughs> and it's it's because uh, I do believe that um, if we look at better ways of running society, I, I don't think it's about getting better leaders any more than getting better companies is about getting better leaders. It's We've tried that, and it's the system that, that's an issue, often more so than any individual within the system. And, and this is the problem in a lot of companies that do a lot of leadership development. They try to like, let's, let's do lots of leadership development. And that's great, but those leaders, even if they have their own transformation of consciousness, come back into the same system with the same structures, the same politics, the same bureaucracy, the same forces at play. And at best, if they manage to keep the change that they got themselves in that system, they will get so frustrated with the system around them that they will drop out and become a leadership development consultant, right? Which <laughs> is where, right? It's ironic, but this really happens a lot. So what we, oh. I think, need in companies is system change all the way to the level of questioning, you know, is, is running with this top-down command hierarchy of managers really the most effective way to organize around the purpose? And if the answer to that is yes, I'm all for it. If the answer to that is it really is the most effective way for your organization, for whatever reason, then great, do it. Do what makes sense for your purpose. But if it's not, 
Perhaps we can question the assumption that we have to have management through a top-down command hierarchy of rulers. And I think we can ask the same about society. Do we need centralized giant monopoly provider of governance or can we have governance without governors, right? Can we have rules without rulers? Can we have a more decentralized distributed system? And I think the answer to that is yes, and would actually recommend my friend's uh, Max Borders books on this. He wrote a book called The Social Singularity, um, mm. followed by a couple others, but um, that's his first book, a great starting point. And, and he writes about this specifically. He also talks about holacracy in there. I do think there are, are ways of applying these ideas to society, but it doesn't look at like using them in the existing framework at all. It looks like coming up with a, a very different framework. If I may jump in, do you, do you have a response, Matt? Um, I don't want no, to go, you, you, you go for it. I, I just had a I just had a simple question. You go for it. Gotcha. Thanks. Um, on the things you've just said, Brian, I think it's important to point out for our listeners also the fact that there's lots of points of intersectionality uh, with holacracy and other s existing systems that are in practice that people already support. And it would be helpful for them to understand that looking into the constitution of holacracy might really enlighten them on how much further they can take their own goals and their own organizations, obviously. And some of those uh, points of intersectionality that jump out at me are um, how cooperatives are ran, uh, grassroots movements obviously, um, uh, things along those lines. But one that it obviously directly contrasts would be our political systems. And I've, I just wonder if, if there was ever a point where you tried to envision um, how and if holacracy could be applied to a political structure and how that might play out. I mean, obviously, um, I think a lot of us here in a millennialist society would agree that, you know, no reform, just abolition when it comes to politics as we know it. But um, how might that look if we were participating in a holocratic society where people, as Marlowe was saying, have a stake, or I think better to say, realize their stake in society? Um, TVP, the Venus Project, uh, they have their own version of an answer for that. But I'm curious about yours before I share theirs. Yeah. Um, so... Man, I, I, I love the question. I actually gave an entire talk on this at the Integral European Conference um, awesome. fairly recently. Uh, so it, it's a lot to fit into uh, just a, a single question. Well, answer, unpack. Yeah. yeah, it's well, um, before you before you dive into that, Brian, we're in this show are not about the transactional. You come onto our show once and, you know, we help cool. you out. You help each other. We're not about that a quid pro quo. We're about the relationship. So we can definitely, you know, continue the conversation and expand it. And I just, you know, I, I've always got to give um, affirmations where they're due. Just love everything you've said so far. Haven't disagreed with, you know, almost anything that you've said so far. And um, just love what you're doing, you know. And we're we're playing in the same sandbox, you know. We're we're trying to create that emergent evolutionary system as a, a response to this, you know, clearly not working system that we have here. And there's yeah. that that's daunting for a lot of people. But I think yeah. that more than that, for me, it's it's in it, it enlightening and and unburdening to step into not just like all oh, all the problems all the problems but like all the solutions all the solutions you know and to step into that process of trial and error and play which is where all, all good ideas come from yeah I'm sorry go ahead yeah totally no i love it um and actually the uh, for anyone that really wants to go deeper into that i mentioned max border's book the social singularity his most recent book is uh, the De the decentralist um, or something like that decentralist manifesto, and it's uh, it looks at how do we have a more decentralized society. And I think the key there, I get asked all the time, could we use holacracy to govern society? And I said, no, don't try. It's the wrong tool. Don't go that way. We need less governance. <laughs> uh, I, I think what we need is a way to allow emergent order, which is not trying to apply holacracy on this giant scale. It's we're not one organization. We all have different purposes, different lives, different paths. And maybe we don't need to govern each other quite so much. What we do need is a way of governing the intersection where we connect, but that doesn't have to be one top-down monopoly provider, right? Like, for example, a um, simple little example, do we really need government to provide uh, court systems? Let's take a, a, a key one as a single monopoly provider. We do need it's courts. Insane, no? we, yeah, we need ways of getting justice. We need ways of, of hearing disputes between people, right? But that doesn't imply that we need one central monopoly provider with one single set of standards, right? Like we could certainly live in a society where purpose-driven entrepreneurs could create their own court systems and you opt into yours, I'll opt into mine. 
That works as long as we have a way to reconcile across the court systems. And there are answers for all of these questions, right? If, if we have a dispute and your court sides with my court, they both find me guilty, then, well, that's easy. I'm guilty, right? But if they find different things, they need a way to reconcile those standards. And there are, there are answers for all of this. There are ways of doing whatever we think of as functions right now of, of government. We do need governance. I'd say we need it in a more distributed way that allows for more evolution. I want to see competing legal codes, competing courts, competing standards to see which works better, right? So that we can actually select which ones do. And all of the government's current ones, as far as I'm concerned, are welcomed as long as everyone else is on a level playing field, as long as anyone else can compete with one of those, let's just make them optional organizations and see what works. There's a lot more to this than we probably want to dive into in depth, but I'd recommend Max's books again, if you want to dig into the, the thing I've read that resonates most with kind of my, my take on it. Thank you for that. That's really cool, actually. I think I think that's one of the books that I have on my bookshelf that I just that I haven't gotten through <laughs> that I that I want to go through one of these days pretty soon. Um, my my question was actually pretty pretty similar and along the same lines uh, as what Amanda was just asking you. I was curious if there are any like organizations or like kind of non conventional maybe business structures, say maybe like nonprofits or cooperatives or or even like just non business structures altogether. Like say somebody has like um like a project in their neighborhood that's like for a community benefit or something like that and there's no actual profit you know there might not be this might not be like a traditional business or something like that um like this kind of aligns a lot with a lot of what we're talking about with our organization because essentially what we're trying to kind of do in the long term is create systems and structures that just provide abundance to people and kind of bypass the monetary and banking system. Say like you have an automated garden within your neighborhood or something like that, right? And and this automated garden produces food, you know, um, for your neighborhood and it does it, you know, with very little labor. Like a lot of it is automated and things like that. Um, but, you know, it's not a business essentially. But on the other hand, there's still are tasks and roles that need to be, you know, uh, you know, things that need to be accomplished, people that need to kind of be assigned in these various roles and things like that. And um, I'm just kind of curious, you know, like, do you think this would be a good organizational structure for things like that? Like, you know, not necessarily, it's it's not necessarily a business entity, but it's, you know, some structure with a, with a purpose and, you know, roles and things that need to be fulfilled, because that's kind of like a lot of the you know, the direction that we're going as an organization and kind of the purposes and things that we're trying to do. So kind of wanted to get your take on that also. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'd say holacracy is a governance structure for organizations. And what I mean by organization is a very broad definition. There is a purpose to get expressed. And there is some kind of energetic boundary that separates what's in scope or out of scope for the organization to manage right? Uh, by that definition, a lot fits in. So we have families that run with holacracy. They, now, to be clear, though, it's not a system for governing people. It's a system for governing work, right? So it's, it's, it's not there to, to, to have authority over individual humans and tell them what to do. It's there to have authority over the roles needed to get the work done, the property of the company, right? It's not there to, to, to boss people around. So you can use it for a family to manage, say, the shared household and all the different work jobs and chores that are needed to keep a household running, right? You can use it for that, but you're not using it to boss the individual people around within. You're using it to set up the structure that we can all come and show up and contribute our gifts towards a purpose. And indeed, there are families running with holacracy. Uh, there are government agencies uh, in various countries using holacracy. Uh, there are uh, social movements using it. There are, uh, you know, community projects, uh, all of those things they're examples of. Nice, nice. So, yeah, to kind oh, of pick up on add, what Matt was. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go oh ahead. just a quick add there. Uh, interesting. What I often see, especially in the, like, the cooperative movement and things like that, uh, you know, it, it's it's ironic to me when I, so many people in cooperatives, especially as they they scale at all or grow beyond just the immediate founding group, they end up with a problem where they've got these, you know, ideals. They're trying to create some kind of more egalitarian structure, give people more voice. But as they scale, they have to like put in place, you know, some kind of business structure and processes. So they end up with management hierarchy, even though the ownership might be at the cooperative distributed level, the way they're running everything day to day is just like any other company out there with all of the problems. And it can actually be worse. People get jaded. It's kind of like, you know, you're in one of those and you think you're signing up for one thing, but now <laughs> it's pretty much like anything else, just pretending to be different. And mm -hmm. ironically, you can do the opposite. You can have a conventional 
investment ownership structure running with holacracy. Or you can also, of course, have a cooperative running with it. But even in that, likely uh, you're actually doing more for the people towards the ideals of the cooperative versus the cooperative ownership structure, right? Because I think the way we show up day to day and work with each other day to day typically impacts our life more than just the final ultimate capital structure of what happens there. Not to say that's unimportant. There's a lot we can do there too. But what matters more to most people day to day is how they work, how they show up, what autonomy they have, how they're treated, what power they have, all of those things. So for cooperatives, it helps align the structure with the ideals and values that they're they're founded around. That makes a lot of sense. I was just curious too, do you know of any co-ops that are actually implementing the holocratic structure at this point? I, yeah, I know there are several. Um, I can't name them top of head because I lose track. There's literally thousands of organizations now doing this. So I can't say any top of head, but there is a list on our website. Um, awesome. You click around there and search. Yeah. Yeah, we'll check that it's, out. Thanks. It's very exciting considering it seems like the more you talk about holacracy, it is an integral part of realizing a comprehensive paradigm shift, you know, in a socioeconomic way. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, a, a lot of the seeds that were planted in the, the past few uh, tangents kind of are coming together to coalesce around what I was kind of trying to get toward, which is envisioning how do we bring together these different pieces? Because there is, I like, I really love that you said that, that holacracy is not a one size fits all. You know, it would not work in this setting, mm. but it would work in this setting. I think that the idea of, you know, creating this decentralized, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Integral and um, anti fragile system where it is a, a, a whole system. You know, it isn't just you know, one thing and applying it to everything. It isn't just moving from one paradigm to another, like people who think that just switching to a cooperative, you know, is going to solve all their problems when, you know, ultimately the structure is not yeah. changed and you, you're still going to get people, uh, you know, like we talked to, we talked to a, a very vast array of people from communists and socialists to uh, radical, you know, decentralists and all kinds of people. And a lot, there's, there's an interesting kind of myopia that comes and an established sort of uh, mentality that comes when people like we have people that like uh, understand how money works how governments uh created out of thin air and how banks created and but they but they still want to use it it's or we have people that you know understand that you know the existing system is based upon war and bloodshed and slavery and all these things but they just want to take that system and be in it they don't want to really uh, ask themselves the question of okay how do we how do we really and truly rethink all of this and create something that is holistic, something that is, as my friend uh, Josh Pazamore, who we're going to have on our show soon as well. I think you, you're he – he's, actually, I was talking to him about you last night. He said, yeah, I've been to his house parties. We never really talked, but you're, you're in the same circles. But his, his, is a, his group is called Green Earth Vision, and they talk about a whole systems approach, which is taking a lot of the principles of holacracy but in, uh, embedding a – you know, shared funding pools and ways of redistributing wealth into funding pools and things like that. It's a very complicated, very niche uh, sort of system that I'm still sort of getting a, a feel for and learning myself because I'm I'm a student of these things and and you know discovering this dimension of governance. It was just truly a new area of my brain that I'd never uh, flexed before. And so, yeah. sorry, real quick, I'm just trying to bring this together into something coherent. But yeah, so I think the idea of bringing together this. Uh, the collective ownership hang on one second so basically taking this principle of the decentralization and the the integral nature of seeing everything as not necessarily um one thing above another but as circles intersecting into other circles creating this equal open access sort of society which is what we're trying to create we're trying to basically take that principle to say okay we don't want oppressive hierarchies we don't want people with more power than others we want everybody to be empowered and i think that our current monetary system our current ownership and property system is clearly a system that allows people to have more things and more pieces of paper or digital bits that represent money that allows them to have power over shaping the governance processes, the legal system, the media, all of these things that cannot yield a, a truly free and open and equal world. You know, These are the things that the American ideals are built upon, but the structure doesn't reflect that. And so I, I'm just, my brain is just surging right now. So I'm kind of going on a tangent, mm -hmm. but you know, the idea of taking the cooperative ownership structure with the holocratic or you know, more egalitarian decision-making system, taking the hierarchy out of it, and in creating this sort of non, like we're not just trying to go into the government and, hide, and you know, grab the reins, we're trying to create our own little worlds. We're trying to create our own decentralized little kingdoms that we're saying, okay, we're going to 
rethink things. We're not going to carry in that aspect of the system. We're not going to maintain this aspect of the old system. We're going to rethink things and create a truly new system. And I think that system can interconnect and scale together. So you have a cooperative that you know, then is, is running holacracy, you have that cooperative connect to other cooperatives where they stop seeing each other as competitors. And they say, okay, now we're cooperatives. We're cooperating in our cooperative and we're working to provide these services for people, not to compete and see who can undercut the other, but to say, okay, functionally, we are the same entity. We have the same goal, which is meet human needs, which is, you know, create happiness and joy and freedom and, you know, all the things that we like to do to make people's lives better you know, to create these systems and c to interconnect them all over the world, because that's the idea. And I think that's how change is going to come. It's not going to come through one central detonation at the top and the redistribution. It's going to come mm -hmm. through us consciously recreating society. Yeah, I agree. And, and uh, I, I think we have to watch out for the, uh, the potential hubris of thinking we have and know the right answer. I and mean, one of the things I've learned had a mirror held up to me in this journey is just how much my own hubris was in the way because it's so easy to think we know what's needed or what's next. And what I keep coming back to is it actually works better to experiment and let reality tell you what works and what's needed. So what mm. we need perhaps is a ground where a thousand experiments can bloom, right? Like where we can try different ways of, of being, of living together, of, of structuring things. And the more we have the freedom to experiment, reality will tell us what needs to emerge next. We just need to listen, right? It's a discovery process, not a creative process. Um, and so I, I really resonate with that. You know, if we want to, to figure out what's next, it, it's it's going to come by by doing. It's going to come by building new systems and sh see if they work, right? See if they work better. And of course, they will in some ways and won't in others. And what can we learn? Well, we'll look to our neighbor who's doing something different. What are they doing? You know, whatever. Uh, and there's also, I should mention, an interesting way in holacracy, there's a, the governance structure supports linking across entities in a really kind of cool way. And we have examples of this now where there's, like for Holacracy itself, there's a whole network of Holacracy coaches. And for them, there's a kind of a whole licensing and certification program. Uh, and those coaches, though, are part of governing that licensing and certification program across organizational boundaries. So there's like broader organizations that they link into and then take part in this broader governance system. So it's pretty cool. You can have this like these networks of, of or meshworks of different organizations all working together and governing their commons together. And that's kind of built into the structure in a way that's really hard to achieve without a supporting structure and, and governance process to do it well. Um, so th there's a lot of potential for supporting the kind of thing that you're describing in a framework like Holacracy. And I think we need others as well. That's Love that's that. really it, it's it's almost amazing to me how much of what you're saying it just like really aligns with and almost parallels like a lot of the principles, um, you know that we're that we promote for our organization and you know the directions that we'd like to go. Um, and I just finished writing a book myself too by the by the same name Moneyless Society, but I'm, I, I talk about the same things in there too. Like we we just need to experiment with a lot of these systems and really figure out what works, and it won't necessarily be all the same across the board, you know. Especially Especially when you're dealing with like different locations and geography and cultures and things like that, you know, what works in Portugal is might not work in Australia or, you know, the Northeast or, you know, Alaska or something like that. There's going to be individual situations and circumstances and requirements for different people and places at different times. And it's going to take a lot of different experimentation and assessment and adjustment to really kind of figure out systems that work, you know, in all these different situations. And, and it sounds like the structure that you know this is created is, is essentially kind of the same sort of thing you know it's it's evolutionary and evolving and adaptable and and you know it's it's it, it's it's a set of rules that are you know just kind of applicable to a lot of different situations um you know and 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 i just find that it's just it just seems like it's very, very much in alignment with the, the kind of mindset and paradigm and direction that, you know, we as an organization and the, you know, the principles and everything that, um, you know, we're, we're, we're heading in. So it's, it's just really cool to be, to, to see that evolving just really kind of on its own, even in the corporate world as well, because, you know, it, it tells me that there really is kind of a, you know, evolution, you know, heading in that direction, this whole mindset of, of all these uh, just kind of core principles that you're talking about there. And this is really just the, you know, the manifestation of it in, in society. So yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, totally. I think that that evolutionary journey we're all on is uh, uh, continues through our systems and structures and finds more and way more and more ways to integrate more and more. 
right? So many things that we see at one level of consciousness as opposed at a broader level become mutually reinforcing and not opposed at all, you know? And I think that's what we're, we're, we're seeing in this, this broader trend is um, mm -hmm. systems that harness and enable more and more polarities uh, that are otherwise at odds to actually coexist. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's an exciting time. <laughs> that's cool. And I was liking what you were saying too, about this kind of like being, you know, it, it doesn't solve all the problems, but it's, it's kind of like apps, you know, you, 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 this is kind of like the basic framework, the operating system, and you can plug in apps, right? Like you, if you need a, something for compensation, we have an app for that. You know, if you need yeah. something for this other thing, we have an app for that. And, and it doesn't necessarily like mean like all these apps work in all the circumstances, but you can kind of pick and choose and take these pieces and, and put these systems together and experiment with it and see which ways work best for your, you know, circumstances and organizations or, you know, whatnot. So yeah, I think one of the, yeah. the beauties of Holacracy, because there isn't a conventional management hierarchy to lean on, you have to get creative with questions like, how do you decide compensation? How do you fire someone? You know, you still have these needs, right? Sometimes somebody needs to get fired, right? How do you do that? If you don't have a single top-down command hierarchy of managers, you have a decentralized power structure. So there's some really good answers to those questions that actually work far better than the traditional management hierarchy answers, so much so that I know traditional management hierarchies that have adopted some of those practices, right? Because they simply work better. Um, but when you- I've got, an, I got an idea. Of, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I've got I an idea for uh, for how to fire somebody. It, it involves, a, it's kind of like a gender reveal kind of thing. It involves a pinata and uh, <laughs> two cakes and- uh, <laughs> <laughs> Try it. Let's, let's learn a thousand experiments. <laughs> yeah. I, I just wanted to say that- Just, I wanted to just say don't that, start uh, a know, forest it's, fire. It's, it's not- uh, it's a different kind of sense making altogether that we're arriving at a conclusion, you know, that if we listen to nature's needs, we're not imposing a belief system on it. We're not saying this book, you know, or this belief or this principle, this idea mandates that we do this. It's saying it's very Tao. It's very Zen. It's very saying, you know, if we listen to the needs of the whole, we arrive at a conclusion. You know, if we listen, if we say, okay, our you know, climate is rapidly warming because we're burning fossil fuels. You know, we have this endlessly growing, expansive, you know, uh, growth system that, you know, we have to change it or we're going to fucking die. You know, we, we're arriving at, you know, changes and different structures and systems to adapt to that, not necessarily to just impose some kind of document or treatise or we're, we're, we're evolving. You know, that's the process of evolution. We're changing with the world, not changing the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, and I think going back to the, the one of my key lessons in that is um, be careful of uh, what I call design from mind or another way of just naming that hubris I talked about. Um, when we think that we know the answer, we have principles and we're going to apply it and we're going to force things to it. Um, we're on, on dangerous ground. Uh, you know, there's, there's a, a great quote from that book, uh, Finite and Infinite Games. Uh, it's something like, I'm going to butcher the quote, but it's, this is the essence of it. It's uh, the, the root of all evil lies in the desire to eradicate evil, right? Which I think is just a beautiful quote. It's thinking, thinking, mind saying this thing, this principle, this is bad. This is evil. Let's try to like rid the world of it. Stop it, you know, save something, which puts us in this, you know, position that the, the people that we look at in history that, you know, we may now say we're, we're really evil rarely thought of themselves that way, right? They thought they were doing like beautiful, great work for society. So I think the lesson here is watch out for our own hubris when we're, we're in a mode of listening, uh, just trying things, seeing what works without forcing our ideas on anyone, right? But let's experiment and, and let's find ways to collaborate that don't require coercion of each other. When we can do that, right? Now we don't have the risk of designing from mind and hubris. And that applies just as much in a company. Right, We have the same hubris from a leader thinking they have the answer to something. When we start just listening, we get used to sensing and responding and adapting. We have less risk from human minds doing what they do and getting quite arrogant and applying their principles on everything, often incorrectly or often in ways that, that sabotage the broader goals. I just want to point out for our listeners um, something in very certain terms that I think is important to say out loud so that 
It's we, we can't get around it. We can't deny it. And that is the ever important um, difference in what we're talking about here with holacracy and what we have today. I mean, all of us here, it's obvious. A lot of our listeners, it's probably obvious to them. A lot of newcomers, maybe not so much. And that's the fact that in listening, as you say, in sensing, in addressing atten- attentions, in following the needs of our environment and ourselves, in, in practicing this emergent system, uh, it, it you know it's purpose driven, but it's beyond that. It it's, it's it's a it's a way that we can not only survive but thrive. And that loops back into what I was saying earlier with the Venus Project and their proposal. And what we also follow would be a resource based economy concept, where the things that are driving the decisions that are made, and what you might say at the top level uh, of you know society and decision making are our needs. It's not some static. Uh, status quo driven, um, you know, compensation driven goal, which as we can see is causing our ship to sink. We're going down with it because the people who are in charge are A, not skilled to make the decisions. There's no demonstrable skills for politicians when it comes to decisions they made who keep uh, people alive or kill them. Um, and on top of that, the fact that they're driven um, from from the root of their power structures, which is money, to hold those, those, those places, those positions of power, uh, they have they have no ability to see into the um, uh, what is the word the potential the holacracy has holacracy type structures and egalitarian type structures have for realizing um, a world in which they don't have to hold that hold that burden or wear that heavy crown or be at the top of some kind of pyramid. Which um, I think you're essentially saying, and all that you have said um, now and in, in other speeches you've done, is that a lot of CEOs and a lot of people in positions of authority actually don't even want to have that. Uh, but again, to bullet back down, I think it's just really important to point out in certain terms that what we have today is a static structure that is clinging to one thing. It's profit based. It's GBD pay, uh, GDP based. It's just a bunch of money that's all it cares about and that doesn't drive evolution that stagnates it so if we're going to move forward and get past all of this we've got to be open to searching ourselves and allowing others the time and space to do that and come together and collaborate communicate and cooperate to build the systems that will allow us to flourish cool <laughs> yeah, yeah fucking hey, Amanda. Rock. I know, right? <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> oh, I, I, I've got some. <laughs> if we do that well, those systems should be better at generating profit than what we have now, right? That's that's the the irony of this. Uh, if we really want evolution uh, and and worlds a world that is more loving, that is is uh, has more capacity to thrive, we need to not demonize anything, including what's there now, including that that current system. It's it's a lot easier to hospice something to death than to murder it, right? This like, is true. Um, so, like, and ironically, when you do all this well, it generates more more abundance, right? More profit now. We can do different things with the profit. We can reinvest it in the next wave of evolution to generate even more. But that's what good nonprofits still make profit. They just don't distribute it out. They reinvest it, right? Which is one trade-off choice. They don't have an easy time getting capital up front, but they can reinvest all their profits to purpose, right? So like, how do we integrate even that and make systems that are even better? Because the right system uh, here should be even better at generating profit per se, than the, the the current systems we have, and while generating better results on everything else. And until we, we have that answer, we are rejecting something and demonizing something, and that's limiting the power at which we are. In the same way that the current system rejects and demonizes certain you know, human values or whatever else, and like as long as we're rejecting something, we, we aren't finding the deepest expression of love in action. That's fair. Mobilization does get in the way. I was just going to say that, you know, what we want to generate ultimately is wealth. We want to generate true wealth, which is creating living systems that are able to perpetually regenerate themselves, that don't need to be constantly serviced with that money chip, you know, that bing, 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 that requires, you know, if you, if you create a good garden and you build rich soil and you're not destroying the, you know, destroying it by tilling and, you know, you're creating something that is every year gets richer instead of getting, you know, stripping more out of the earth, you know, that is creating more biodiversity, that is creating more food abundance, more, you know, uh, health and holism in society, you know, we want to create the happiest people, 
We want to create these mutually reinforcing feedback loops and ultimately invest all the whatever it is, whatever the metric in society. And of course, right today, that's money. You know, we need that stuff to do anything. And so I think we do need to create these transitional structures that are able to work within this paradigm and show people, hey, look, it works better. It does what we what we say that the system does better. You know, people, you think you want money, you really you just want access to food, water, healthcare, community, maybe a swimming pool every now and then. You know, transportation. Mm-hmm. We want to be able to create you know systems that can create these things perpetually, so that they're not that we don't need the money stuff. That it, it our our need of that uh, wanes over time. So at first it's a money less society, and then it gets us toward the society where we just don't ever think about it. Nobody's ever questioning, you know, can we do this? And that's and that stops being the central feedback mechanism that we use to make decisions, which is how much money do we have? It's, you know, or how much money will this make us? It's, you know, we have mm-hmm. everybody participating in that process of making decisions. And, you know, that's the power of democracy and, you know, new forms of democracy, not just that blanket mob rule, but like a feedback system where everybody is, is optimizing the, their needs you know, with new sort of uh, algorithms and metrics for planetary health and biodiversity and sustainability and things that we can automate, you know, and embed through algorithms, through AI, through much more sophisticated processes than pieces of paper with presidents printed on them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, that's a beautiful thing about really powerful tools. Like one of the things I love about Holacracy, the diversity of people and viewpoints that find it like ideal for what they care about <laughs> is vast because it, it isn't right, rejecting anything. It's just creating better in whatever dimension, whatever metric we care about, you know? So it can be uh, something in the rare overlap that people of radically different political philosophies can all agree on because it is creating more true wealth, abundance, uh, uh, effectiveness, success in every metric and dimension, you know? And, and that's, Mm-hmm. I, I, in a world that is as divided as we have right now, where there are so many tribes and camps and all that, like I, I hunger for tools that we can all say like, Hey, look, you know, that really hits, it may not be the ideal of any of us, but it really mm-hmm. advances everything for all of us. And what we all care about here, uh, it can be a unifying force. Nice. Yeah, it's a beautiful I, thing. I was curious. I guess it's kind of a question. I was just kind of curious to hear your thoughts. Um, so in my book, I talk about uh, systems thinking and conflicting goals, uh, kind of being one of the archetypes that uh, the profit motive essentially is, it has a hard time getting around. I was curious, you being a CEO too, if you've kind of witnessed this or to what extent uh, you think Holacracy might be able to kind of mitigate the situation. Um, but a lot of the time, uh, what we see with, a situation that creates inequality essentially is uh, it, it's like how the rust belt essentially got gutted and a lot of these jobs ended up going overseas. And that was essentially the mechanism of conflicting goals where you have two goals and decisions have to be made. Essentially, a lot of the time you, you end up making decisions that benefit one goal at the detriment of the other. And it's very difficult to serve both goals at the same time. And one of the common scenarios in this conflicting goals archetype that we see in, um, you know, systems thinking is, is, a. Uh, essentially outsourcing jobs or, or labor, essentially cutting labor costs, right? Because of the mechanism of, of competition in capitalism, right? There's all these companies competing to try to sell their products. And essentially after you cut, you know, materials costs and rent and energy costs and all these things, a lot of the last thing that's left is usually labor, you know, so these labor cuts get caught either with, you know, automation or reducing workforces or over outsourcing jobs. And that essentially ends up creating a lot of inequality. And um, I was just curious, like, do you think holacracy could combat that sometimes? Because to me, it's kind of like one of the, you know, the main, I don't want to say, you know, faults of capitalism, but it's, it's essentially, it's creating this feedback loop of inequality where, where the, uh, you know, you can't really invest in both a lot of the time. You can't cut the job costs and, you know, stay competitive or you can't stay competitive and invest in the community and pay more workers more at the same time, you know, and that's kind of one of these dynamics that we see within the profit system that is very difficult to overcome. And the only ways that we were kind of really seeing that is just eliminating the profit motive altogether. Um, 
you know, and, and, and holacracy kind of we think that might be one of the systems that helps us do that, you know. Yeah. And I was just kind of curious to get your your thoughts on that. As a CEO, have you kind of come across that situation of you know cutting oh, yeah. job costs and all that? And what what do you see as a solution potentially to that? Uh, I, I would I would argue that uh, cutting the profit motive is just as bad as cutting the you know uh, like let's take care of our people you know let's have a good environment for our people motive. Um, mm-hmm. I think as soon as you are putting those at odds, we've missed the chance for a higher order integration that actually leverages each for the benefit of the other, um, mm-hmm. which is is what we have in really healthy systems. We have uh, the parts that are not at war, right? But we find the higher integration. And not to say that's always easy or practical, but that's the question to be in, is how do we make these not opposed? And there are so many examples of companies that find ways to do that where they can pay their people more and use that. Like Trader Joe's is a good one. I worked with the guy that built it into what it is today for a while. And Hmm. you know, one of the things he said is like, they found when we just pay our people a hell of a lot more than a typical grocery store, right? the, The we can leverage that people are like delighted and joyful and we can use them for lots of different roles and not just like menial work. And, and that leads to customer satisfaction and that leads to better profit. And so they found a way where these two weren't at odds anymore. So I don't usually do this, but sometimes in the heat of discussion, it's hard to get a point in without disrupting the flow. I think this is a really important point. I just want to very quickly break down the numbers here. The average salary at Trader Joe's for cashier is $13.15 per hour which is substantially above the minimum wage. So good job, Trader Joe's. However, the average US rent is around $1,200 a month and rising. For rent to cost less than a quarter of income, as suggested, you'd need to make $4,924 a month. At 40 hours a week, that's $30.77 an hour. Other studies have shown that if minimum wage had kept up with productivity, it would be around $26 an hour, which it certainly isn't. The federal minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. We can't even get $15 an hour without corporations flipping out because, of course, it's simply incompatible with their bottom line. Let this be a reminder, of course, to follow us on social media for your daily dose of ideological multivitamins. But I point this out because it's a very simple illustration that paying people a living wage, to say nothing of a truly thriving wage in the current system, simply isn't feasible. If Trader Joe's paid their cashiers $30 an hour, which should be the minimum wage, they would certainly have to make other cuts that would affect their bottom line and make them unable to stay competitive, which doesn't make them unethical as it simply illustrates that truly conscious capitalism is simply unaffordable. Back to the show. Come on, like and subscribe. Hey, give us a comment. Come on, just give us a like. Hit hit that like. Come on. All right, all right. Anyway, back to the show. To me, the, the, the power is in what's the integration. And... The other thing I can say for that is the whole idea, though, before I uh, defend this profit motive too much, let me add the idea that a company exists to maximize profit for shareholders is a recent fabrication. Um, and it's a terrible idea. Uh, I, I mean, a really, really terrible idea. It's, it's like saying, you know, the purpose of life is blood. No, you, you need blood. You need it to live. Most companies need profit to live, but that doesn't mean it's the purpose of, of their life, you know? So, Instead, let's orient around the purpose because that becomes the integrating question or force there. And what we can do with that is say, well, how do we best serve this purpose? What what change is best serving this purpose? And you can look at purpose as just what's the deepest creative capacity for this organization to channel into the world? What what Mm -hmm. is the deepest expression of love that this organization can uniquely bring about and create in the world or love or spirit or whatever you want, spiritual language you want to use for that? What can this organization do, bring, channel? That can become the, the integrating point. And sometimes... Sometimes that might mean you make a cut and you cut people because that's what this purpose demands. And sometimes you're going to cut profit because that's what this purpose demands. Sometimes you're going to do something that hurts some other stakeholder because that's what this purpose demands. Ideally, you find the ways, this is the question to be in as a good leader, how can I not have to sacrifice among them? How can I find the system that actually looks at them as an interconnected system? Because if you hurt your customers, you're going to hurt your profits. If you hurt your profits, you're going to hurt your employees. If you hurt your employees, you're going to hurt your customers. They're all mm-hmm. interconnected. So we ideally want something that 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 uh, integrates all of them. And if we can't, if we have to make a hard choice, which sometimes we do, let's let purpose rule. And let's tell all everyone right. transparently going into that, that's what matters. Investors, when you mm-hmm. put your cash in, know that we are purpose-driven, purpose is leading. That's what we're putting first. And customers, it's about the purpose. And employees, it's about the purpose. 
And mm. when we have to make hard choices, that's what we're going to use to make them. And that's something that it's not privileging. We're not fighting amongst these classes anymore. It's something new that we can all serve, be in service to. You know, it's not about trying to get from the company for me, whether I'm an employee or an investor, right? It's more like a parent, parenting a child. It's not for my sake. It's for the child's sake. This child has a purpose in the world. How can we be in service of that, whether we're an investor or an employee or a customer or whatever else? I want to pick up on that because uh, I was thinking about the whole time you've been talking, the person I've really wanted to send this episode to when it comes out is my dad because we get into these conversations all the time. He says, I'm a conscious capitalist. I say that's a contradiction in terms, you know, but we, we're very aligned in terms of sustainability and terms of understanding the unsustainability of the system. Last time we talked, we had dinner, we kind of got into an argument, but we kind of, you know, spun it around. And, it, and he basically said, look, okay, we have a system that is, we have a fake democracy. We don't really have a democratic process. We have a parasitic system. You know, we have these corporations that are just gobbling up the world that have captured our processes. You know, we need a new system. And that's always his perspective is you can't just fight the old. You know, you need to do the, the Buckminster Fuller quote, which is to make a new system that makes the old obsolete. And so I'm very sympathetic to the perspective. And I think your approach and your values and ethics and not just your ethics, but your system, your structure to embed that into the action of the company I think is one of the most progressive and one of the most powerful that I've seen in creating this, uh, basically this alliance between what I would consider the activist world, the world that says, hey, we need to change things. People are dying. Like the world is coming to a fucking end. You know, we need to change things now. And government's not doing it. And, you know, these mega corporations that are, I don't see them making these changes and these shifts voluntarily. I, I think that uh, without at least, well, the, the first line I think of making change is, building our way out of the old system so that we're not constrained in our thinking with you know paying rent and just meeting the basic needs and you know just the, getting past the artificial scarcity that you know these the current corporate system wouldn't function if people had high wages if people's healthcare wasn't tied to their employment they just would they simply wouldn't tolerate you know the abuses of you know the very unfair you know corporation 1.0 operating system so i think in creating this alternative transitional structure that does operate within the rules of this system that does you know need to make profit or at least to make money to be able to circulate the blood in our ecosystems to the blood in the body of our you know thing that we're trying to create i think that the big question is beyond that we could say we can pull it off and come together and and you know People like yourself are going out there and, and sort of uh, ministering to CEOs and to people in your world or in the, the corporate world to say, hey, look, we need to change things and we have a better thing. And it, it's a very compelling, beautiful thing to say, look, this just works better. It works better for you. It works better for your employees. It works better for everybody. But I think that there are certain factions in society that just simply will not give up their stake. They, they're not going to say – you know, we need to roll over and stop the system. We need to stop, you know, systematically limiting progress. We need to, you know, we need to maintain control and power. We don't want to give up. We don't want to get up off the throne. I mean, even if, even if we say it to them in all these ways, like you were saying, it takes an extraordinary kind of person to make that shift. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on, say we can pull it off. We can create this holocratic, interconnected, you know, uh, commons enriching system of systems of these transitional new kinds of cooperative enterprises to create a new society or new societies everywhere. How do we get up against that big system though? That's the big question. That's the big if to me. I think we're so close. I've never felt closer to that with all the pieces here, but I have yeah. an answer. Go ahead. I have an answer. It's not a concrete it. answer, but it's a start. Um, and this has taken me a hell of a long time of pushing against systems to get to. Um, if you want to change it, the first thing you have to do is love it. Um, and same thing with people, you know, do people change better when they're told what's wrong with them and how they're bad and how they're limited, even no. if there might be truth in all that, or do they change when you love them as they are? And by loving them, you help them figure out what's next for them. And mm -hmm. I, I find the same is true with systems. I am so much more effective at system change when I figure out how to love the system that I'm trying to change. And then love becomes a service. It becomes a... a the defenses drop of the system itself uh, and the entrenched players in it. Not always, but it works far better than anything else I've found. So for me, when I want something to change and it's like bugging me and there's a lot that, that hits me that way at first, my first question is inner work in myself. How can I accept it, embrace it, not reject it and love it? Um, even if I'm also hoping to change it. And ironically, there's a paradox in there to truly love it. 
I have to accept it completely as is and not want to change it. Right. And, and it's at that moment where I drop all my desire to change it. And I just utterly see the beauty in it. How, how radiant shining example of, of love and action has gotten it to this point. And I no longer feel any need to change it. That's the moment at which I become most effective in changing it. So I, I was having this conversation with, um, uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger, and we were talking about basically that same thing, that this system, like it, love it, hate it, whatever it is, it got us to this point today, which is the point of existential ruin, the point of, uh, you know, millions of people dying every single day, you know, the, the point of interminable ecological collapse, but also the point of having the technological capabilities and basically pushing us into this position where we have to change. Like an addict who has fully hit rock bottom and at that at the very bottom of the pit, gains this freak sense of gratitude for life itself, this sense of like, I want to live actually. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to live and I want to start bringing myself up. And that's the point where you start replacing these old bad habits with new ones. And so I think we are in the position we're in and I think we can point the finger and blame and you know uh, hate and rage all we want, but it doesn't change our situation. And so we have to make peace with who and what we are and where we're at. And and to do that is very difficult. And I think that is a truly radical shift that has to happen in all of us to basically accept things as they are and to say, no, no, things aren't just perfect. They're all that they could ever be in this scenario. Maybe there's infinite timelines going off in every direction and there's a reality where we evolve totally differently, but this is the reality we have. And so we have to love it. We have to say, okay, we would not be having this conversation of, okay, motherfuckers, we need to change everything. We need to stop doing this. We need to stop doing this. We need to create a whole new system. We need to you know, create this beautiful future for all of our children. We need to create a better world than has ever been possible. And I don't think we would ever arrive at that world that the, the, the visions of people like Jacques Fresco or the, the ethics of people like Tesla, we wouldn't get to that world unless we went through this horror, this terrible calamity or this, you know, this anentiodromia is Jung's term of where you push something so far in one direction, it comes out the other side and comes to the other side. So I, I do love the scenario that we're in. And, you know, and, and that's a hard thing to understand. I just want to make sure that, that the people listening understand that that's what it takes to do that that to love your enemy is to love yourself and your own manifestations of this old system your old 1.0 ideology and you know to truly embrace that and say okay let's move forward yeah charles eisenstein uh, another friend of mine does a great job in his books if you haven't read it i highly recommend uh, his awesome. book yeah, it's great. The more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. I just even the title of the book, right? Yeah. It does such a beautiful job of of not shying away from the need for change, but doing with just love and acceptance in his heart. Yeah, that that's a really beautiful book. I, I love that book too. I actually quote a passage from that book in my book yeah. too. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I just wanted to kind of just really quick touch on something before we go. Um, you were saying like the purpose, and I totally resonate with the purpose of an organization. I think a lot of the time, what we're what we're trying to do is kind of just take the profit motive and obsolete it. It's not necessarily like we hate it or we have anything against it. We're just kind of objectively looking at it and we realize that sometimes there are, you know, conflicting interests there and that a lot of the time, I mean, it, it doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes there are and and sometimes it would behoove us just to kind of get the profit motive to exit stage left so we so we don't have that conflicting interest anymore and we can completely focus on the purpose of what's most important, you know, whether that be providing food, water, energy, housing, education, healthcare, you know, things like that. We want to put those systems and structures in place that actually serve those purposes most effectively. And, um, and like we said, we want to experiment with it and do it, you know, if, 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 if it makes sense for it to be something that doesn't really involve, you know, profit and public, you know, I mean, private interests and things like that, then, then maybe that could, you know, maybe that could be the best way to do things. Sometimes maybe it is, sometimes maybe it's not. So, um, but anyway, so that's that's just kind of all the, the last little point I wanted to add. But um, yeah, so thanks thanks for coming on so much. I, I think we're just very much in alignment, and I love what you've done with you know your the organization and the management structure and all that. And we're actually really looking forward to implementing it in our organization also because I think cool. it's just perfect. And, um, and we're almost would love there. to have you on again in the future to kind of discuss how that's yeah. going. Maybe you could give us some pointers on that or something. But um, yeah, once again, thank fun. you so much. I loved the conversation. I had a lot of fun, guys. Really appreciate your engaging. So Great. thank you all. Thanks, everyone, awesome. for listening.
I just want to encourage our listeners really quick to look at the holocratic constitution. It's on GitHub. Is that right? And when you read it, start envisioning how that can be applied to doing things like realizing, realizing our, our, you know, full potential as humans, as social uh, evolving beings, uh, recognizing each other's worth rather than competing and also how to better manage our tangible forces, our resources like water distribution, for example, and things like our technological um, capabilities, like being, um, you know, in, co- in control of AI versus being its slave, just because we change how we interact and organize with each other versus competing. So, yeah. yeah. Well, this has been awesome. a great, great talk, but I think, I think, you know, we just yes, got to Thank say, you for being here, time. Brian. Yeah. In the spirit of the whole on, the part containing the whole, we're working to change the social structure, to change the individual, to change the social structure, and so on. Starting with our own organization and movement, which we are building up from scratch, a volunteer labor of love. As always, I'm finishing editing this episode at 3 a.m. the night before release, so if you loved it, please go the extra mile and support us on Patreon for as little as five bucks a month, and get access to exclusive bonus content, clips from the movie, and more. To go deeper into the problems and solutions we talk about on this show, get yourself a copy of the new Moneyless Society book by our very own Matt Holton. I'm reading it now, and it is a brilliant, systematic blueprint to a better world in every way. In a world crazed by lunatic leaders and smashed down to the bottom by the pyramidal structures of hierarchy, I found wisdom in the Tao Te Ching that essentially tells us that the way to transcend hierarchies outside of us first is to stop trying to be a controller and a dominator of the world around us in our own mind. It says, if you want to be a great leader, you must learn to follow the Tao. Stop trying to control, let go of fixed plans and concepts, and the world will govern itself. The more prohibitions you have, the less virtuous people will be. The more weapons you have, the less secure people will be. The more subsidies you have, the less self-reliant people will be. Therefore, the master says, I let go of the law and people become honest. I let go of economics and people become prosperous. I let go of religion and people become serene. I let go of all desire for the common good, and the good becomes common as the grass.